is David Paul, Executive Director of Spire Mining. Uh, David's talk is entitled Development of the Coking Coal Industry in Northern Mongolia. David. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, while just the slides getting set up, just want to say it's great to be here. Um, this is the second time we've presented. Um, we've done a lot in the last 12 months. And if you were here listening to me last year and you went out and bought our stock, you'd have made 800%. So well done to those of you who did. I'm not going to predict the same outcome today, but nevertheless, this is the exciting part of our industry. This is exploration. This is where high returns can be had uh, if you pick the right entities. Thanks. Just as a quick uh, snapshot before I'm talking about uh, development of Northern Mongolia. Uh, we're a company with a market cap of around $400 million Australian um, as of today on a fully diluted basis. And we are actually a real Australian-Mongolian partnership. 20% um, of my shareholders are Mongolian nationals uh, and they're essentially the vendor group who uh, partnered with us in developing this asset. And, uh, and they've um, been important partners with us ever since. Apart from uh, the uh, nearly 20% that they hold, um, the board holds around 30% and we have a couple of other strategic investors I'll mention later. Um, we're currently, uh, our stock actually rose and has actually halved uh, in the last uh, four months, probably many stocks have. Uh, nevertheless, at around, we're around a dollar a tonne uh, of resource for what's a very good hard coke and coal. And that's, uh, that's cheap by any measure at this point. In terms of our investor base, uh, we actually ha attracted really early on uh, two strategic investors, and South Gobi Group, which obviously is well known to you, uh, and they hold around 20%, uh, and uh, the Noble Group, who actually bought on market, um, and both of them are very active, obviously, in the Mongolian space. Uh, the Noble Group are one of the world's largest commodity traders. They sell uh, coal and coke out through Russia and Russian ports, as well as have a significant business uh, importing, exporting uh, commodities in through China. Just to talk about our project, and, uh, and, in, and in the context of development of northern Mongolia, everything you've seen, uh, seen I've seen today has very much focused on the south, as it should, because there's some fantastic deposits up there. But the northern part of the country also has fantastic deposits, and it's been largely overlooked. I had a, a good discussion with our, my colleagues at the World Bank just recently, and they were amazed at the prospectivity uh, and the scale of potential assets in the northern part of the country, and it simply hasn't been recognised as yet. Um, so certainly that's something that we'll try to address. Um, oops. Just on here, um, our asset, our main assets, are our Voot Coke and Coal project, which is just there. It's only 60 k's from the Russian border. Uh, it's approximately 160 kilometres west of the town of Moron, which is a, the capital of the Hufskal province. Um, and Moron is approximately 390 kilometres from Erdenet. Uh, the triangles there are our projects, which um, essentially sit along what we think would be a, a, an appropriate alignment for a railway connecting those assets. And that is the key obstacle to development of these assets in this part of the world. Just also want to uh, give a plug for uh, a company called Xenadu, who has an asset just right between our Jilchigvalag and Neuron projects. It's a new discovery and is just indicative of the exploration potential in this part of the world. This is an unrecognised coke and coal province based on Jurassic Age coals. And yet, if you think about it, it shouldn't be a great surprise because just 300 k's away from our Ovoot project is a billion tonnes of coke and coal. It's called the Elagast Hard Coke and Coal Project. It's a billion tonnes. It has not been fully developed, mainly because it's surrounded by uh, seriously significant mountain ranges, and hence rail is an issue. Again, we always come back to infrastructure and rail. The other main um, interesting factor here, and I put it on this map um, to give you an idea, is that the Kerbass Basin, which is to the south, uh, to the north west of us, uh, is uh, where half of Russia's coal reserves and resources sit. And they have a viable long-term industry, which is based on exporting, uh, obviously internal consumption, but exporting thermal coal from that basin 6,000 kilometres along the Trans-Siberian Railway. 
all the way out to Pacific Coast. And I just want to make that in a context. This Mongolia should be seen in the context of, of Russian assets and where these things are, and not just simply in terms of uh, China. Key parts of infrastructure here are the red line here uh, going through Mongolia, which is obviously the Trans-Mongolian Railway, uh, the proposed TT railway connection going from TT uh, through to the Russian rail system, uh, and I've put a yellow line here through what I believe should be the next proposed rail line, which is a rail line connecting Erdenet through to Moron and eventually to our project, um, and I'll, uh, I'll explain why later. Just to, uh, given, I will spend a bit of time on our Avut project because um, I, I think this project is a catalyst for that development. So we need to understand, is it big enough and is it good enough to drive that, uh, that development? This is a license plan, as three licenses that cover what we believe is the Avut Coke and Coal Basin. Uh, we've been operating and we developed a resource last year, which we announced in October, in that little blue square, in the Jork Resource Square and that reflected about 10 square kilometres out of a 500 square kilometre tenement package, contiguous tenement package. It is very rare in the world to find 500 square metres of prospective ground connected together. Uh, it's 50,000 hectares in other people's language. It's a significant, significant ground position. Um, it's going to take us a lot longer, I think, than we thought to actually fully explore this asset. We've uh, approved a 10,000 metre exploration drilling pro program in 2011. We're about halfway through that. Uh, we're having some uh, drilling difficulties uh, in order to meet that uh, target, but we certainly will meet it by 2011 because we've now got four drilling rigs on site working heavily away. We have about 70 people in the camp at the moment and, uh, and there's, there's, a high there's a high level of, uh, of production. Um, we're actually incurring a lot of water, which uh, is a very unusual thing in Mongolia, but in the northern part of the country, um, we believe we've got a, certainly ample water for, uh, for, our, for our activities, both exploration and also coal washing. But the really exciting thing about this uh, is that we need to understand the basin of this, uh, the basement of this particular deposit because the coal appears to form in what they call the lower Jurassic sequence, which appears just basement. So we find where the basement is and hopefully we'll find where the coal is. And so far this year we've had very little success in, in drilling through the basement. Uh, mainly because of water and drilling performance issues. So in a, in a nutshell, we've got a very good resource around 330 million tonnes, uh, but we expect to grow that over time. Uh, just to look back at the resource, um, this is a Jurassic Age resource, which is a little bit different. There's a few reasons for that. Um, it's younger. Uh, it's younger than you find the Permian Age coals in the south of, the, of Mongolia. But in the Jurassic Age, there was more plant matter and therefore uh, you generally have larger seam formations and that's what we see here. Uh, there's only two seams of prominence in this deposit and that holds around 93% of that 330 million tonne resource. There's two central seams. Upper seam, that red colour there, the UPP, which averages around 12.5 metres and then three, uh, three uh, plies of the lower seam, LOA, B and C, and they uh, average between 5 and 18 metres. So they're pretty thick seams. We're very fortunate as well that uh, some three quarters of our deposit is above 250 metres in thickness. So that means uh, a lot of that will report to an open pit. Um, and given thick seams, it'll be a high productivity open pit. Uh, the other point to take away from this is that most of this resource is in the measured and indicated category. So this is not a guesstimate. This is actually a pretty well-defined resource as it currently stands. This gives you a little cross-section just to give you an idea of how the seams sit together. Um, this is actually through a, a section of the ore body, a small section of the ore body where we're looking to, to create a starter pit uh, to start production earlier. Um, it's what we call our stage one development which would see some coal starting uh, and being trucked to uh, Erdenet and the and eventual customers uh, rather than uh, waiting for the railway. But uh, that's something we're, we're still working on. But this gives you an idea of how thick the seams are and also the sequence between upper seam in the red and the lower seams in the yellow and, and, uh, and grey below. Uh, I also want to point out the fact that uh, there's a large amount of what they say, what they call catenary cover, um, which is mentioned just there. Uh, that's essentially alluvials and gravels 
uh, unconsolidated and essentially free digs. It's very cheap uh, removal. Um, so this, is, this, is, uh, uh, this also emphasises the fact, as I say, that uh, a lot of the coal sits just above the basement, which is just through here. Hence the absolute need for us to really be able to define the shape of this basement. Apart from being a good deposit and obviously having a high productivity open pit, we need this to be a, a quality deposit. Um, carrying thermal coal uh, out of Mongolia, it's not going to go very far. and Everyone sort of agrees with that. So this needs to be not only, I believe, a, a, a good coke and coal, but a great coke and coal, and we believe it is. We've, had, we've received all of our washing analysis from our 2010 program based on our resource, and we had uh, you know, an excellent result in that uh, on, the, on average, that's the good and the bad, on average we achieved an 80% yield to an 8% ash product, which is make it one of the lowest ash coking coals out of Mongolia. In a volatiles range between the 25 and 28%, um, but with CSNs, uh, which is crucible swelling number, which is indicative of its caking properties, of 8 to 9, so right at the top end of the range. Sulphur is on the high side, it's around 1%, uh, and that's something we'll have to manage as we go along. But this product is actually going to sell not so much on coke strength necessarily, which is still something to be determined, but it's on its fluid and plastic properties. Um, these are world class properties, uh, usually defined and can be defined what they call the Grey King coke type to give you an idea of these properties. Generally, a very good one is what they classify as a G8. I've seen ones at G10, and I think we've created a new benchmark at G11. Uh, Wood Mackenzie completed a report just recently, and I think it was about three weeks ago we put out an announcement. Uh, what we wanted confirmed is that yes, it will be priced um, at the hopper end of, uh, of uh, hard coke and coal prices, and they certainly confirm that. Um, they described it as a strongly caking hard coke and coal with, with superior, superior blend carrying capacity um, within an ideal range of the mid-volatile uh, hard coking and fat coal classifications. Uh, this has a lot of similarities to Elagast, which I just mentioned up there is a billion tonnes nearby. And more importantly, it's really a value-added blending coal, which will actually upgrade a lot of cheaper inert coals to its very high vitronite content. Vitronite content's here in the 95% range, um, which is, at the, again, at the upper end you'll find globally. That's very important when you think about markets like India, where they have abundant, abundant coal, poor quality, high ash coal, with vitronites around 55 and 60% and therefore this can really make a difference. Um, and just finally, just on coal quality, just to push the point a bit further, uh, Wood Mackenzie produced this uh, comparative slide that showed uh, 